the distractions we have to get your focus off what's really important. But the Lord is my light and my salvation. And because he's my light and my salvation, I ain't scared of you. Whom shall I fear? This ain't no rookie to the game. This ain't a new brother on the street. This is the psalmist David. If anybody knew anything about feet, it was David who stands with a giant in the valley of Eli called Goliath. David who runs for his life from King Saul. David who's thrown out of his own kingdom by his son Absalom. David whose daughter was raped by her own brother. David who has to mess up with Bathsheba and has to stand before God. David who's got the battle with the Philistines always in his rear view mirror. David who had to fight a bear and a lion. If anybody knew what it was like to be afraid, it was David. to be afraid of everything he had reason to worry with everything that pushed the don't go to sleep button in his life David yet winds up with this statement the Lord is my life and my salvation whom shall I fear let's pray Lord uh, our lives need to hear you Lord to speak into our situations tonight, Lord. Amen. So we are uh, in a, a series of sermons called Back from the Brink. And what we mean by that is there are some situations in life that kind of take you almost to the end of your resources. Uh, you get to the stage where you're not sure if you're going to be able to cope anymore. And uh, we are thinking tonight that, that possibly uh, one of the most powerful experience or emotions that we can go through that takes us to the brink, that takes us to the end of our resources, is fear. And if you read the book of Psalms, you, you'll find that it's full of people who have been taken to the very brink, uh, almost taken to breaking point. And we can identify with that. But the, the great thing is there aren't just stories about people being brought to the brink. There are also great stories of hope, of them being brought back from the brink through their faith and what God's doing in their life. And I wanted to show you that little clip uh, just to remind you that the person tonight uh, when Jonathan read Psalm 27, and this psalm we're going to look at tonight, it is written by somebody who really did know what it was to be afraid. This isn't any ivory tower sermon. This is comes from real experience in his life. David knew what it was to have fear that has the ability to grab you and overpower you and mobilize you and sometimes imprison you. Sometimes bring us to the brink. And maybe looking back, some of us even saw that fear took us over the brink. But we were reminded, and I would love to come back as an African-American preacher, that voice, that David wasn't no rookie when it came to fear. When it came to fear, David had been there, done it, and bought the T-shirt. He knows what he's talking about. Now, this might take some of you back to the 80s. Do any of you recognize these? Any of you? Yep, you were involved with the Navigators. So the Navigators, a great organization that, that works with students. And in the 1980s, when I came to faith, uh, someone gave me a little pack of these memory cards. And uh, there was a little pack of them, and you were meant to memorize them. And I was in the police, and often being in night shift, and sometimes we had to do really boring things, you know. Uh, we had to guard a crime scene or something, so I would learn and memorize these. And that's the first time that I remember coming across Psalm 27. And if I remember right, uh, th there was three verses in particular 
from Psalm 27 that I memorized. Because when I came back to the psalm, I could still kind of memorize them. And there was verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In verse 13, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then finally in verse 14, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And maybe some of you kind of knew those words, but you weren't quite sure where they came from. Uh, They come from Psalm 27. And I think those verses are so well known and so well loved because they're just full of confidence and faith in God. And to use a a kind of Christian cliche, they're about that kind of thing about faith over fear. But if you thought Psalm 27 is just a kind of proclamation of the power of faith and it's full of confidence, actually it's not. So there's certainly parts of it that, that are about kind of faith over fear. But the whole psalm is actually more like faith mixed with fear. It's a psalm that if you were listening to Jonathan as he read it, you'll have heard that it's a psalm full of mixed emotions. I don't know if you caught the change in tone. Uh, Verses 1 to 7, there are these bold declarations of faith. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? It's full of faith. But then... You get to verses 9 and 12, and it appears that his faith has kind of evaporated and been replaced by fear. He's terrified that God would allow his evil opponents to triumph. He's worried that God's going to desert him. And then if you move on again, when we get to verses 13 and 14, it feels like his faith has returned. So there's these mixes of emotions of fear and faith. And I don't know if you ever do this, if you've got Spotify or or, uh, YouTube and you you mix up your playlists so different songs get put together. And some experts in the Old Testament think that's what's happening in Psalm 27. They think actually it was two separate psalms, one that focused on the experience of fear and one that focused on the experience of faith and somehow they got linked together. I'm not sure that's the case, but it's trying to help us understand the psalm. And so this is a really tough psalm to understand. Its message isn't clear. And I was really struggling this week. And then there were two theological helpers that came to my aid who have got really impressive facial hair. So here's the first one. You'll probably recognize him, John Calvin. Uh, Isn't that impressive facial hair? Uh, If you don't know John Calvin, uh, he led the Protestant Reformation just here in Geneva. Now, I've got to be honest, there are certain aspects of John Calvin's uh, theology that jar with me a little bit at times. But he wrote a commentary on the book of Psalms that is one of the most spiritually enriching books that I've ever read. And so it suddenly struck me that I should go back and and maybe see what Calvin had to say. Uh, And he was talking about verse 3, which is, though an army besieges me in my heart, my heart will not fear, though war breaks out against me, even then I will be confident. And he makes a remark about verse 3 that I think is really, really helpful. Here's what Calvin had to say about it. He said, my heart shall not fear. This does not imply that he would be entirely devoid of fear. For that would have been more worthy of the name of insensibility than of virtue. But lest his heart should faint under the terrors which he had to encounter, he opposed to them the shield of faith. Do you see what Calvin is saying? Calvin says that whenever David says, my heart shall not fear, he doesn't mean that David wouldn't experience any fear 
at all. In fact, he thinks that if you believe that, you're kind of insensible. In other words, he's saying, you're a bit daft if you think you're going to go through life and never experience fear. That's not what is being promised here. And he goes on and he talks about the fact that later in the psalm, there are some things that David was right to be fearful of. And there are some things that he says in our life that we probably are right to be fearful of. But what Calvin said, and this is a really important bit to grasp, he said that despite experiencing fear, David wasn't paralyzed by fear. He wasn't paralyzed by fear because he opposed it. He used his faith as a shield. And this is a really important bit. This is, this is the key insight, I think. One of the two key insights from tonight. And here it is. This is kind of a summary, my summary of what Calvin was saying. Faith can make us not fearless, but fearless. So faith can make you not fearless, but fearless. And I've got to admit that in a, in a couple of periods in my life, I heard all these messages about faith over fear, faith over fear. And I, I kind of felt that I was failing as a Christian. I got guilty and, and felt a little bit ashamed because there were still some situations that I felt fearful in. I wasn't paralyzed by fear, but I couldn't say that I wasn't fearing at all. And, and, you know, Calvin's comment there just releases me from that guilt. And maybe there's some other people you hear tonight, and you need release from that guilt as well. That you're not a failure because you still experience fear. The American preacher Max Lucado kind of says the same thing as Calvin did, but in, in more modern language, he says, the presence of fear does not mean you, you have no faith. Fear visits everyone. The key, though, is through faith, making your fear a visitor and not a resident. And so that's the first key takeaway. One of two things I want you to take away from tonight. Faith doesn't make us fear less, but can help us to fear less. Faith can bring us back from the brink. And so then the big question is, well, how do we fear less? How do we use faith as a shield? What's the role of faith in counteracting fear. And that's when my next theologian with very impressive facial hair helped me. Now, I've already told you about John Calvin. Uh, my other theological helper was Ava the Poodle. Uh, if you uh, don't know, Ava's our standard poodle. I think she's a great dog. Uh, I think she looks great. Uh, she's affectionate. Uh, she's obedient most of the time. One thing Ava is not is brave. Uh, to be frank, Ava is a coward. Uh, and so this week, we were out walking in the woods. We turned a corner, and there was a dog who immediately barked at her. Ava ran, hid behind me, and tried to get as close to my legs as she can. So, you know, the idea that your dog's going to defend you doesn't work when you've got a poodle. And that happens with children as well, doesn't it? If you've got young children and, and they suddenly get scared or they suddenly fear something, what's the first thing they do? They run to their parents, don't they? They, they want to be with their parents. They want to be close to their parents. And I think what we see in verse 4 is David doing an Ava. This is what he says. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Now, you need a little bit of background here to understand what David is actually asking for. He's not asking to be in a worship service that goes on forever and ever and ever. We've all been in some of those, haven't we? 
uh, what he's talking about is the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, before the temple was made, was a, a, a big kind of tent. Uh, they had the Ten Commandments, the Ark of the Covenant there. It was where the sacrifices and the worship happened. The important thing for you to understand is that the only people who could actually go into the tabernacle were the Levites and the priests. And David, you might know, uh, was a great psalmist and he was a king, but he wasn't a Levite and he wasn't a priest. So it's not meant to be taken literally, but for David, the tabernacle was the place where you encountered God. It was the place where God's presence was most tangible. So whenever David says that he wants to be in the tabernacle all the time, what he's saying is, I want to be in close to God's presence. I want to get as close to God as it's possible for me as a human being to get. I want to be in God's presence and know his presence in my life powerfully and tangibly. He wants to be consistently with God. And that verse is a kind of equivalent of Eva running and hiding behind my legs. He's wanting to be with God. And ever, whenever he says that he wants to seek God and gaze on his beauty, he's saying, not only do I want to be with God, I want to know God better. Did you notice that Psalm 27 starts off with some great theology? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And David was saying there from all his past experiences, he understood that in his darkest moments, God would be his guiding light. That in the most dangerous moments of his life, God had saved him and been his saviour. That in the most anxious moments of his life, that God had protected him and been his stronghold. And David took those truths to heart, and, and maybe you do need to do that too. David's past experiences of God had taught him so much. But here in verse 4, he's saying, Lord, my, my, my deepest desire, the thing that I want more than anything else, is deeper intimacy and greater clarity. I want deeper intimacy with you. I want to dwell in your presence. I want to be as close to you as I can get. And I want greater clarity about who you are. I want to seek your face. I want to gaze on your beauty till I know you more clearly. And David understood something that I think is incredibly important. Yesterday's experience of faith won't sustain you in today's experience of fear. Your experience of God yesterday won't sustain you today when you face fear. David understood that all of his experiences in the past, everything that he learned was a great foundation. It was a great foundation for facing what he was facing. But what do you do with a foundation? You build on it. And that's what David is doing here. He's building on that foundation of what he knew about God in the past. I have this written in my Bible beside verse 1, and I, I wish I knew who had said it originally. It said, when your faith in someone exceeds your fear of something, fear will lose its grip. When your faith in someone exceeds your faith, uh, your fear of something, fear will lose its grip. And that's what David understood. If he wanted to stop fear gripping his life and crippling his life, he had to know God more deeply. And his faith in God had to exceed his fear of the situations and the people he was facing. 
And I think sometimes we, we, we kind of make a fundamental mistake. We think we have to generate faith. I need more faith, so I, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm, I'm going to have more faith and we're going to try hard. And that's not the way it happens. We get more faith by getting to know God better. The more we know him, the stronger our faith will grow. And so the first takeaway from tonight, if you remember, was that the promise is not that we'll be fearless, but we're going to fear less. So the second thing that we want to take away from tonight is to fear less, seek more. David says in verse 3, my heart will not fear. And I really believe that that's connected to what he says in verse 8. My heart says of you, seek his face. And here's a big lesson for you to learn. To fear less, seek more. To stop fear gripping your heart, start your heart seeking God. Did you get that? To stop fear gripping your heart, start your heart seeking God. Be like David. Seek to be more in his presence. Seek to understand his character more clearly. And here is the great news for every single one of us tonight. God deeply, deeply desires for you to know him better. And the reason I know that is because there's an invitation in the psalm. If you've got the NIV, it's a bad translation. This is a better translation. You have said, seek my face. And my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. And David said that he heard the Lord giving him an invitation. Seek my face, David. And I think God is saying to every single one of us tonight, Saying to your heart, seek my face. He's calling you to seek his face. He's inviting you to know him more intimately. He's calling on you to know his, his character more clearly. He wants you to love him more passionately, trust him more courageously, to experience more of his presence and his power and his peace. So let me ask you, how are you going to respond to God's invitation to you tonight? To seek his face. Did you see how David responded? David responded with determination. Your face, Lord, I seek. He didn't have to be asked twice. Lord, I'm determined to seek you, to know you better, to grow closer to you. I'm going to do everything that it takes to seek your face. So how about you? Are you willing to respond to the Lord's invitation to seek his face with determination? Because let me tell you, it's going to take determination. Seeking the Lord, it can't be a casual pursuit. It's got to be the passionate pursuit of your heart. It's about craving his presence, longing for his guidance, desiring his intimacy, to seek God's face. You've got to align your life with his ways. That's why in the psalm, David says, teach me your ways. You can't seek God's face if you're not walking in God's ways. You can't seek God's face if you're not reading God's word. You can't seek God if you're not praising God's name. And you can't seek God without persistent, consistent prayer to God. Apostle Paul was in a Roman jail he was chained to several Roman soldiers. He knew that any time the door opened, it could be an executioner. I'm sure he experienced fear. But there, in that Roman cell, he dictated the book of Philippians. And right in there, we discover the same thing as we see in David. 
We see Paul using his faith to fight fear. And this is what he says. Uh, I think it's great in the Amplified Version. For my determined purpose is that I may know him. That I may be progressively more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. If you want to fear less in your life, are you willing to make that your determined purpose? To make that your great ambition. Because you see, here's what happens when we make that our determined purpose. We are feeding our faith and at the same time starving our fear. So what about you? I want to challenge you to share Paul's determined purpose. And here's the great thing. You can start right now. Right now. 